is groundbreaking chop suey, a cultural history of Chinese food in the United States, was a finalist for a James Beard Award and named one of the best food books by the Financial Times. Uh, Let me stop you for one moment, Norwin. I'm going to mute everybody because the people are talking in the background. And then I'll unmute you and Andrew. Oh, you have to mute yourself. Okay, everyone is muted except you and Andrew and myself. And Norwin's still muted. Norwin's still muted? Oh, now he isn't. Okay. No, he's not. He's named one of the best food books of the year by the Financial Times. He's written books, articles, and blog posts on everything from the ancient history of foie gras to the secret criminal past of chocolate egg creams, where to buy the tastiest bread in New York City. He has appeared in documentaries such as the National Geographic's uh, Channel uh, East, the story of food and the search for General Tsao. He and his wife, uh, Jane, live in Brooklyn, New York with their two children. It's a pleasure to welcome uh, Andy to this program uh, this morning. We regret uh, some tough technical issues here, but I'm sure you'll find this uh, time uh, most fulfilling. So with that, I'd like to uh, present uh, Andy Coe. Uh, thank you. Um, first, uh, um, Norman, thank you very much. Um, first, actually, I'd like to share my screen because I have a, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, can we do the share screen? Yes, Andrew, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, here we go. So welcome to Ashkenazi Jews and Chinese food. Jews always know two things, suffering and where to find good Chinese food. A Jew and a Chinese man find themselves seated next to each other on a plane. They start comparing their respective cultures. Says the Chinese man, we're an old civilization. This is, year, this, this is the year 4718 in the Chinese calendar. Well, we're older. This is 5781 in the Jewish calendar, replies the Jew. The Chinese man makes a quick calculation. So for a thousand years, what did you eat? According to my re research, that's the oldest Jewish Chinese food joke. Actually, Jews have only been eating Chinese food for about 120 years. The vast majority of Eastern European immigrants who arrived through New York City came from the shtetl. They were used to a diet of bread and potatoes, herring, milk, and cheese. Meat was a luxury only consumed on Shabbat and holidays. Most of them did not have the restaurant habit. This picture shows um, um, on the Lower East Side, um, um, the residents picking up free matzah, um, you know, just before Passover in 1908. Many of them first settled here on the Lower East Side, at the time, the most densely populated area on earth. That's the red, zo uh, the, the red zone here, um, particularly the part um, um, circled in black. Of course, not all of these immigrants were from the shtetls. Some came from big cities like Warsaw, Budapest, Lodz, and Vilna. And not everyone from the shtetl was a greenhorn who be behaved like Tavia the milkman. The Lower East Side was dotted with restaurants and coffee shops catering to the small clan the clans of Yiddish-speaking spe sophisticates the theater crowd, poets and writers, journalists for newspapers like The Forward, and assorted socialists, communists, anarchists, and so on. This is a scene inside a Jewish socialist cafe. At the same time that Eastern European Jews were settling on the Lower East Side, we're talking about the 1880s and 90s, a few blocks away on Mott and Pell streets, a small group of Chinese immigrants were building New York City's first Chinatown. They opened up businesses catering to their community, including Chinese restaurants. Around 1885, Chinatown was discovered by the Bohemian crowd, goyish or artistic rebels who liked to travel down to the tenement districts to imbibe the exotic flavors of the new immigrant restaurants. On Mott Street, they tried something called chow chop suey, 
a toothsome stew made of bean sprouts, chicken parts, and other unidentified ingredients. The Bohemians discovered that they liked it, though many were squeamish about what it contained. Sensing a new market, canny Chinese chefs toned down the dish and came up with what we know today as chop suey. Here's a modern iteration, celery and onions, bean sprouts, chicken, shrimp, and roast pork, everything contained in a gloppy sauce. This is the dish that launched the fad for Chinese food in the United States. So in these early years, did Jewish Bohemians follow the crowds down to Chinatown to eat chop suey? My guess is probably not. But after 1900, Chinese restaurants began to open outside of Chinatown, including along the Jewish East Side. Here's a menu from a restaurant on Third Avenue between 14th and 15th Street. You already see Chinese American favorites like chop suey, chow mein, and down here at the bottom where, where is Fu Young Don, which is we know better as Egg Fu Young. This was Chinese food made safe and palatable for Western tastes. Jewish New Yorkers avidly got gobbled it down. How do we know? Well, here's a 1914 description of the kind of customer you'd find it in a Chinese restaurant. It's the proletariat that's chiefly given to hungering for Chinese food. Its crowds are co composed of commoners, clerks and shop girls, minds on rare outings and gaudy tasteless finery. Sprinklings of many nationalities gleaned from the motley east side. Your hearing doesn't have to be particularly acute to hear those dog whistles. From New York, the Chinese food fad spread rapidly to other cities with large immigrant populations. In Chicago, palatial Chinese restaurants opened in the Loop area. This is a full page ad for Joy Hing Lo, at the also known as the Mandarin restaurant at the corner of State and Adams Streets. The Tribune reported that Chinese food was the third most popular cuisine in the Ch city's restaurant world after American and German. And this is um, actually, I have a, a large Chinese menu collection and this is a, and a, a, some, some shots of the, uh, my King Joy Lo menu. And you can see on the right um, all, a lot of the uh, the dishes that they served, and you know up here near the top, this is what most Americans were going for at the time: um, chop suey. Around this time, Chinese restaurants started advertising in publications aimed at a Jewish audience. This ad ran in the program for Yiddish theater on New York's Second Avenue. Tangerine Gardens advertised in, in the forward. The chef of this Brooklyn restaurant supposedly prepared his chicken chow mein in, using the same recipe as in the Chinese emperor's kitchens. You could get it for just 75 cents right here. Jade Mountain on 2nd Avenue and 11th Streets was a favorite of a left wing crowd. Its ads in the Daily Worker boasted of proletariat prices and exhorted comrades try some, some real Chinese food. In Chicago, these are, are just some of the restaurants that advertised in the newspaper, the Jewish Sentinel um, during the 1920s. Uh, most of them are either in the Loop area or, or on the North side. And uh, Horowitz and Sons, um, at the corner of Roosevelt Road, I think it's at Crawford, I can't read it on this because um, um, sold, some, sold some of the Chinese restaurants by serving Chinese food served by our own Chinese chef. What was the attraction of going out for Chinese food? In the food world of the early 20th century, there was nothing more exotic than a Chinese restaurant. The weird imported furniture, colorful paper lanterns, supposedly inscrutable waiters, and menus filled with mysterious dishes. This was the era when newspapers were filled with stories about Chinatown Tong Wars and opium dens. Rumors said that most chop suey joints were fronts for the white slave trade. A young woman visited a Chinese restaurant alone at her peril. For Jewish diners, there was an extra thrill to eating Chinese because the many of the dishes included shrimp, lobster, and pork. For immigrants, particularly the shtetl born, obeying the laws of Kashrut was a central tenet of their faith. 
but their children were city born and raised. And they saw Jewish law as an, ap as an obstacle to enjoying the fruits of American life. They attended public schools, got jobs, and went out for lunch with co-workers. When they saw a ham sandwich on the menu, they ordered it and with a little thrill, gobbled down the forbidden food. However, however eating ham couldn't compare to one's first visit to a Chinese restaurant. In Jewish fiction of the era, a woman's initiation to Chinese food was often associated with sex. The first taste of shrimp, rubbery and slimy. The first bite of pink and glistening slabs of roast pork. In Herman Woke's Marjorie Morningstar, the title character is a virgin until the evening the boyfriend offers her a plate of char siu or roast pork. Here's the initial thrill and then the letdown. Quote, eating the pork gave her an odd sense of freedom. And at the same time, though she suppressed it, a twinge of disgust. Later that night, she sleeps with her lover for the first time. Others navigated between tradition and modernity with far less anxiety. Molly Picon was the queen of Yiddish stage and screen. A newspaper profile revealed that at home she kept kosher, but outside she loves to go to a Chinese restaurant and eat pork. That's her favorite. Keeping kosher at home, or at least on the holidays, but enjoying trafe in the outside world was a common practice. And it seemed particularly easy to enjoy tray foods in a Chinese restaurant. The rationalizations came on many levels. In Eastern Europe, kosher law had been a way for Jews to define themselves against the larger Christian society. But what religion were the Chinese? And Chinese food seemed almost Jewish. They used a lot of onions. There was no dairy on the menus. The wontons looked like kreflach. And then there was the way the pork was served, shredded in egg rolls, cubed in the chopped suey and fried rice, scenting the stock of wonton soup. If you couldn't see it, it didn't count. They coined a term for it, safe treff. It's hard to quantify the amount, but it appears that Jewish diners back then had a real appetite for fit, forbidden foods. In the 1920s and 30s, Brownsville, Brooklyn eclipsed the Lower East Side as the country's most popular Jewish neighborhood. On Pitkin Avenue, the Wuhan Tea Garden was a favorite for family dinners, mahjong parties, and bar mitzvahs. Here's part of the menu. The specialties are on the, the left and the, and the ever popular family dinners on the right. And see here on the left, you see egg roll, fresh roast pork, fresh roast pork, large portion, pork ends, pork ends large, large portions, lobster, fried boneless pork uh, ribs, et cetera, et cetera. Still, there was often, amount of, uh, often a certain amount of guilt involved. There was the rabbi who liked to sneak down to Chinatown to eat a certain dish. And, would you, and wouldn't you know it, one day a member of his congregation wa wanders into this restaurant. Rabbi, how are you? What are you doing here? Just then, the waiter sets down in front of the rabbi a platter containing a whole roast suckling pig with an apple in its mouth. Can you believe the production they make in this place, exclaims the rabbi. You order an apple and they bring you this. Chinese food wasn't just for restaurants. Jews also began to prepare it at home. The most popular dish I think uh, among um, um, for Jews was probably chicken chow mein, a staple of family dinners, bridge parties, hadassah lunches, and on and on. The easiest way to prepare it was through the magic of canned foods manufactured by La Choy or Chun King. The meals were sold in two canned packs with a chicken stew on top. You can see the pack down here on the lower right and the crispy noodles on the bottom. For observant Jews, however, there was an issue with chow mein. What kind of noodles, what kind of oil were the noodles fried in? Usually some kind of animal fat like lard. Entrepreneurs saw the market for kosher chow mein noodles crisp in vegetable oil. This on the left is a um, picture of a rabbi um, inspecting the noodles in a New York City um, ch uh, chow mein noodle factory. And on the right, we have two ads for um, Minneapolis uh, chow mein noodle factories, which both of which are kosher. And um, 
I don't know if anybody who was watching it is, is, is from Minneapolis, but if you are, you will know that in Minneapolis, there, there still is a, a um, strong love for chow mein. Um, rather than chop suey, chow mein was the most popular Chinese dish in, in the Minneapolis area. Chinese food wasn't just for restaurants. Jews also began to prepare it at home. Oops, we already got there. Um, slightly more adventurous cooks, and we, by the way, it's not hard to make, use the recipes printed in, use the recipes printed in the foreword in other Jewish newspapers, or in the cookbooks by trusted experts like Jenny Grossman. This is her famous chicken chow mein on the left, which was also served on El Al's flights to the Holy Land. And here she is with, I think you all recognize, Danny Kay. And um, in the history of Jews and, and Chinese food in the United States, I think he deserves his own little sidebar. Daniel Kaminsky, born in East New York, Brooklyn, discovered the, the, the delights of real Chinese food on a vaudeville tour of Asia during the 1930s. He became determined to learn how to cook that food himself and took lessons with famous Chinese chefs. After he became Danny Kay movie star, he bought a house in Beverly Hills and built a complete Chinese restaurant kitchen in a shed out back, including a three wok stove and a Peking duck oven. Some people install insanely elaborate train sets in their basements. Danny Kay's obsession was preparing real Chinese food from family dinners to elaborate banquets. His guests ranged from Hollywood royalty to the teller down at his bank. But considering the taste of most movie stars, I'm not really sure how many actually enjoyed it. After World War II, the Jewish exodus extended to the suburbs where they moved into neat tract houses and spoiled by urban grit and crowds. Their religious, cultural and culinary needs were met by synagogues, community centers and Chinese restaurants. Eating Chinese was no longer the edgy urban experience of a half century earlier. For families, it became a weekly ritual, Sunday night chow mein, always sitting in the same booth, having the same arguments and ordering the same dishes. Will Elder illustrated the perils of these meals in his Mad Magazine feature, Restaurant. Here, it's hard to see in this crowd, the Sturdley family right here, waits patiently for a booth amid the chaos of a Chinese restaurant on a Sunday afternoon. Now, after many trials and tribulations, Pa Sturdley is about to take his first bite of chicken chow mein, crisp noodles, stewed onions, bean sprouts, strips of chicken, snowy rice, a dab of English mustard, a dash of soy sauce, all lifted to your mouth. Whoops, baby has to leave the room. And I love this little bit of what um, uh, was they called in the, in the trade, chi the chicken fat, which was the technical term for Will Elder's background gags. Today's specialty, egg foo young with gefilte fish. During this post-war era, Jews found another role for Chinese food. Ever since their immigrant grandparents had first set foot in America, they had faced the challenge of Christmas. Those who chanced to arrive at Ellis Island around the end of December were bewildered by the halls decorated with Christmas trees. 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 Toys and cookies were pushed into their children's hands eager to Americanize, Christianize, Christianize Eastern European Jews. Public schools featured big Christmas celebrations during which all students had to sing Christmas carols. Jewish community leaders forced the Board of Education to halt these festivities. Weaning Eastsiders from such habits as exchanging presents on December 25th proved a harder task. Their solution, of course, was to elevate Hanukkah from a relatively minor Jewish holiday into big league status. That meant Hanukkah rituals, foods, decorations, games, and presents that could, could compete with the Christmas industrial complex. However, the, Chris, the question remained what to do on Christmas day when everything was shut down and the city became a ghost town. They could stay home and play games. They could go to the mov a movie theater or if the family had money to the Catskills or a Miami Beach hotel. Or they could eat Chinese for Christmas. What better idea than to go down to Mott Street and stand in line outside Wohop for an hour or so. It might be freezing cold, 
but they, but they knew that steaming bowls of egg drop soup and chicken chop suey over rice waited for them inside. During the 1960s and 70s, American Jews' relationship to Chinese food changed as they themselves changed. The first innovation was the experience of the Lower East Side kosher Chinese restaurant, Bernstein on Essex, AKA Schmulka Bernstein's of blessed memory, where West meets East for a Chinese feast and Kosh Ruth is guaranteed. It was actually a Jewish deli that started serving rabbinically approved Chinese food two nights a week. The menu included chow mein Bernstein made with chicken livers. The guy on the right here looks like he could be eating it. Many of the waiters were, chi were Chinese adept at mimicking the mannerisms of dour Jewish waiters. Perhaps they shared staff with Ratner's rest dairy restaurant around the corner. In 1961, China's New York, uh, Chicago's New York kosher restaurant hosted a special pop-up Bernstein at Essex event. Now, for the first time, the Orthodox Jew can taste the food specialties of the Orient. And here, of course, is the chow mein Bernstein, wonton, um, and then it says Chinese crap block, if anybody didn't understand. Um, barbecued kosher spare ribs, which were obviously beef, egg foo young, chow mein, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, this was only a pop-up, however, and it, obviously it didn't last. In fact, I think the first, well, we'll get to that a little, a little bit later. Um, at well, at first, kosher Chinese food was originally mostly a novelty act. Those in the know went to Bernstein's for the spicy pastrami, not the chow mein. Then in 1963, Ruth and Bob Grossman published their Chinese kosher cookbook. The recipes are written with a heavy dose of borscht belt shtick. The dishes have names like string beans, suris, haddock, yenta, sweet and sour, sweet and pungent beef chunks, oi gavolt, and so on. Still, they actually work. And gradually, more full service kosher Chinese restaurants started opening, such as Moisha Pig King in New York's Midtown, Shangshai and Yun Ki in Brooklyn, and I think that in Chicago, I can, from what I can see, there was a, a, an Israeli, a Jewish Israeli Chinese restaurant called Cafe Haganet, which was the first um, kosher Chinese restaurant in Chicago, but maybe somebody on this uh, uh, call can uh, correct me afterward. Um, these restaurants serve the Eastern European version of Chinese food, heavy, vegetables overcooked, with veal taking the place of pork and flounder replacing shrimp. Dishes included innovations you couldn't get in Chinatown, like frankfurters and a sweet and sour sauce sprinkled with chow mein noodles. Still, for the increasing numbers of Jews who kept kosher, liked to eat out, and wanted Asian flavors, kosher Chinese was the only game in town. During the same era, the 60s and 70s, not so observant Jews were growing bored with the weekly visits to Lee's for chow mein and egg rolls. Thanks to changes in immigration laws, waves of Chinese immigrants were arriving from Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Southeast Asia. They brought with them food traditions from other parts of China, particularly Sichuan and Hunan, and began to open restaurants. The food was challenging, featuring new ways of eating like hot pot and new flavors, particularly chili peppers, the hotter the better. Milton Glaser and Jerome Snyder's underground gourmet column in New York Magazine was the most popular guide to these cuisines. They extolled the delights of minced pork with bean cake, which we know now as mapo dofu. It became a sign of your culinary sophistication or hipness if you could enjoy it, if you could enjoy it cooked Sichuan spicy. And in Chicago, they had restaurants like, this is the Abacus on North Clark Street. Um, the photo was taken in 1975. And here the diners are um, enjoying Mongolian hot pot, um, which of course wasn't Mongolian at all, but was something which was, um, you know, it's a very popular dish, family dish style dish in, in central China. Um, and you had, you know, it was, it was a, it's a fairly complicated meal to eat and, and you certainly showed your sophistication by knowing how to enjoy a good hot pot meal. By the 1980s, Chinese food had been American Jews' favorite foreign cuisine for almost a century. 
This primary, this primacy would not last, challenged not by a cuisine, by just one dish belonging to another Asian culture. Sushi. A slice of raw fish on top of a finger of vinegar flavored rice seasoned with a little soy sauce and Japanese horseradish. Sushi was the decade's trendiest food. For Jews, it had particular attractions beyond being trendy and fresh tasting. Everyone, it seemed, was on a diet. Chinese food was too greasy and heavy. And by the way, this was, be this was because that was the way they liked it, not the Chinese. But sushi was low fat and tasted a lot better. For the observant, the dish was particularly useful because it was par, either meat nor dairy. So it could be served with fewer kosher restrictions. Chicken chow mein disappeared from buffets at bar mitzvahs and weddings, replaced by big trays of sushi rolls. Chinese restaurants fought back by adding diet sections to their menus. Steamed vegetables served on brown rice, which is a terrible dish, I must say. <laughs> um, and they hired their own Chinese sushi chefs under the correct assumption that, assumption that their customers couldn't tell one Asian from another. This is the sushi menu of Cho Sen Garden, a kosher, um, a longtime favorite kosher Chinese restaurant in Queens. So here we are today in 2020. Not much has changed, except that we're in the middle of a pandemic. And who knows what the food world will look like when we emerge. Right now, we can't eat takeout. We can't eat inside a restaurant, so we get takeout. Jews still eat Chinese and order sushi, but they don't have the same historical and cultural and emotional connections to raw fish on rice that they have to chicken chow mein, kung pao shrimp, shrimp and mushu pork. The bond still defines them. Jews are a people that like Chinese food. There have always been jokes about Jews and Chinese food. Now there are also articles, documentaries, dissertations, and even books. There are no firm whys or wherefores to the relationship. Like any great love affair, it just happened that way. And while we're waiting to see what happens next, we can always order out. And um, I just like to, um, one interesting thing is that um, on Christmas day, which, which happened fairly recently, um, there were a number of um, Jewish restaurants in New York City, which, um, put together really creative Chinese Jewish menus. And, um, and this is a, a special menu from Mile End, which is a Brooklyn, Montreal Jewish deli style restaurant. And um, here you see at the top, um, this is the part of the Mile End Jewish Christmas feast. And there's General So's poutine. Um, I don't think I'd ever order that, but I'm fascinated that somebody could come up with a dish like that. Um, so thank you very much. If you have any questions um, or comments, please let's let's start the conversation. I can't. Does anyone have uh, questions uh, through the chat box or? Uh, Andy, there appears to be, uh, uh, I've noticed locally in the, this area that uh, some Chinese restaurants are closing. Is that due to the fact that perhaps the next generation of family members chooses to uh, look at some other way of uh, making a living? Well, um, I mean, right, right now they're probably closing because of, you know, the economic downturn due to right. the COVID. But um, before that, yeah, they were closing um, because, you know, before, at, during the current era, um, luckily, um, Chinese have a lot more opportunities and, um, you know, young Chinese now, uh, you know, they go to, to, they go to college, they have a lot more opportunities in the workplace um, than they did um, even 20 years ago. And um, so that's, yes, that's one of the reasons why, why Chinese restaurants are closing. And I remember a story I ran across, and I think it was from an Indiana, uh, a town in Indiana, where to just to give you an illustration of, um, you know, how how opportunities were not available back then during the night. Let's I think it was during the 1970s. 
a young, uh, the son of a, a Ch local Chinese restaurant family. He was the school valedictorian. He had by far the best grades in school. And, you know, according to, to, to tradition, they always, the school always gave um, a, um, a full scholarship, college scholarship to their valedictorian. But that year they decided not, they did not. They um, did not would did not want to give him the scholarship, so he couldn't go to uh, he couldn't go to college. He actually went on to become a very successful restaurateur, but uh, any kind of op other opportunity um, was closed to him. So that's no longer the case, uh, luckily. Thank God. Did you come across any interesting stories about pioneers who really saw uh, the Jewish market, either Chinese or or Jewish? Well, I mean, certainly, I mean, the, this, the, the people who, I mean, the people who opened the, um, the, the chow mein noodle, the kosher chow mein noodle factories um, certainly saw the Jewish market. And um, there, there were also um, a, a bunch of entrepreneurs who um, before um, La Choi in Chongqing, who started canning um, chow mein and chop suey, including kosher um, um, businesses. Um, so that was, I mean, people, you know, they realized that this this business was there, um, but it, it didn't really sort of click until the the kosher Chinese restaurant world um, uh, started going um, with Bert Bernstein on it and Essex, and that really didn't actually start going. Um, I mean, now kosher Chinese restaurants are a common part of a lot of cities in the U.S., um, but that didn't really start until late '70s and '80s. Uh, the question. Uh... For yourself, are you on social media, Twitter, et cetera? Um, no. Well, I'm a, have a small Twitter presence, but I'm I'm an anti-social media person, um, and um, you know, I hate to say it, but current events have, <laughs> have even re have reinforced that. Um, but um, you know, I'd be happy if anybody has any questions. I'd be happy to to give you guys uh, my email, and then anybody can uh, write to me. An observation. Anyone who can wants to meet themselves can do so to uh, ask a question now. Uh, there, there was a comment that there appear to be more Thai restaurants opening up while Chinese uh, restaurants are closing. Uh, well, uh, I mean, what's, what's, I mean, it's interesting. Um, and I mean, I, you know, I don't know about, I couldn't tell you about an individual Thai restaurant in a neighborhood in Chicago, for instance, but a lot of Thai, Thai and Japanese restaurants um, around the country are actually run and operated by Chinese um, because they think that the, they see that the Chinese market is saturated, but there's an um, but there's you know definitely a market for for other Asian cuisines, um, and the Chinese are extremely entrepreneurial, as I've said, and um, so. Uh, so it, it may they they're Thai there may be Thai restaurants but they're not always Thai people who are who are running them, just like a lot of Japanese restaurants are actually run by Chinese. What is your favorite? If you uh... well, I have to say, I mean, my favorite Chinese cuisine is is Sichuan. I would say because I, I really love spicy food, and um, um, but you know I I. You know, but I'm also somebody, I love variety. I love, um, and you know, we live, or pre, in pre-COVID days, we lived in, in, a, in a world where there's, at least in New York, and, and I, Chicago has some of that too, where there's incredible variety of, of um, foods from all over China, which are, which are available. And I love, you know, trying everything and trying new things. Um, so uh, it's, it has been a great time to uh, enjoy Chinese food in, in the United States. Um, you know, we'll see what happens um, over the next couple of years. But, um, you know, one of the things with, about the, you know, Chinese food in the United States, it's all, always been um, linked to political and cultural relations between the United States and China. And, um, you know, with the, you know, there's been obviously there are tensions now, but in that relationship, and it'll be very interesting to see how that affects what kind of food is actually served in, 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 in the United States and, and, how, and, and how many immigrants from China come over and what kind of immigrants they are. 
What what prompt? We had a question from one of our uh, listeners this morning. What prompted you to write the book and become an expert? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'd always liked Chinese food. And I actually, I grew up in a family where my father worked for an organization whose, whose initials are, are CIA um, in Taiwan during the, the 1950s. And so he tasted like incredibly good high-end Chinese food at that time. Um, and then he came back to the United States, started a family, and, um, but he could never find that Chinese food again. So, um, so he, but he was always searching um, and, you know, he had very high standards. So, and we did get some good Chinese food. So um, I was actually one, one day, I'd been also starting to do historical research about New York City. And, and um, I'd seen a picture in the 1940s of um, um, New York's Chinatown and all the restaurants, instead of saying Chinese restaurant on their signs said chop suey. And I was in Chinatown, uh, um, you know, sometime later, and I and I said, and I noticed that none of the restaurants had those chop suey signs anymore. And I was asked myself, you know, what in the world was chop suey? Because I was never allowed to eat chop suey when I was a kid because it was not considered real Chinese food. Um, and so, what was chop suey? And um, what happened to chop suey? Why did it, at least here in New York City, disappear? And um, that investigation turned into an article which was published in American Heritage. And um, the article was turned into a book and here I am. Can you comment on uh, the rest of the world in terms of uh, this cuisine uh, in Israel, uh, kosher Chinese? Well, kosher Chinese food is, is uh, definitely exists in, in Israel. Um, and, and in the rest, you know, in the rest of the world, it's interesting is that um, this is what's there um, over 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 the decades, um, American style Chinese food for many, many years was the dominant style of Chinese food in many countries around the world. Uh, I have a large Chinese restaurant collection, including um, Chinese menus from, from India, from Guatemala, from, you know, many different countries. And um, a lot of them serve chop suey and chow mein. And um, because that's what a lot of people around the world, you know, expected, you know, as, you know, in a Chinese restaurant. But of course in China, um, there's not really, it's ch chop suey doesn't really exist. And chow mein exists exactly in a completely different form than the American dish. Um, so, uh, and now because of the China, you know, the, the Chinese, you know, new waves of Chinese immigrants and Chinese workers spreading around the world. Now there's a completely different style of Chinese food, which is, which is appearing, you know, all over Africa where, where you know, with big Chinese construction um, projects and, and in many other parts of the world, but it's, it's completely different food and it's much more like sort of spicy Sichuan food and dishes like that. So there was a question, why did chop suey go away? Uh, well, simply, simply, I mean, that's one of the big questions in my book. Um, and simply um, because tastes change. Um, back when chop suey became, um, you know, it was, you know, one of the most, you know, it was like the fad food of the early 20th century. Um, and it was, bland, it was overcooked, and it was gloppy. And um, that was how what Americans expected from their food. Those were the tastes and the flavor sensations and the sort of mouthfeel of dishes that, that they really liked. And, um, you know, during the 1960s and 70s, um, Americans decided that they didn't like that anymore. And they wanted stronger flavors, they wanted crisper vegetables. Um, and, uh, and they also wanted what they considered more authentic food. And um, that was a huge cultural change in the food world. And um, that's why chop suey you know, largely disappeared. Um, actually, I mean, I think that chop suey hangs on in the Midwest um, more than in any other part of, of the country. I mean, you can still, it's much easier to get chop suey in Chicago and uh, St. Louis and places like that than it is to get it in New York or Los Angeles. 
the Christmas phenomena, was that just because most Christian restaurants were closed and yes. that was all there was? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, I mean, that was, you know, well, first of all, they had a taste for Chinese food, you know, when it started. Um, that never went away. But um, um, yeah, they noted, they, you know, realized that um, Chinese restaurants sort of never closed. Um, they didn't, uh, I mean, now actually Chinese restaurants close more often on various holidays, but at, at the time they, they were 365 days a year. So um, it was uh, kismet that uh, brought uh, Jews and Chinese restaurants together. Any other questions, uh, Randy? We certainly want to thank you for your time this morning. Uh, apologize for the technical glitch. Uh, Andy's book is available uh, online. Would you like to comment on that? Uh, yeah, let me, I'll show you a copy. Thank you. This is the book, Chop Suey, A Cultural History of Chinese Food in the United States. And it's a, a, available at a, a very reasonable uh, price. I forget what it is now on Amazon and, and all the other uh, Barnes and Noble and, and, and everybody else. Okay. Uh, uh, there was a question here, entertainment with Chinese, Kung Pao comedy in San Francisco. Uh, uh, well, there's, yeah, there's, uh, I mean, that's one of the, um, one of the traditions that sprung up, um, you know, San Francisco has a very fa famous one of um, um, eating Chinese food and going to um, comedy events, um, you know, Jewish comedy with Jewish comedians on, on uh, December 25th. And uh, I, I found an ad from a, a Cincinnati Jewish newspaper from, from I guess the 1980s and uh, the ad said, tired of going, just getting boring old Chinese food on Christmas. Come see Robert Klein, comedian Robert Klein at um, the uh, Cincinnati JCC. So uh, yeah, that's, that's comedy has also become part of the Jewish Chinese, the Jewish December 25th tradition. Okay, well, we'd certainly like to thank you again for your time this morning. And uh, for those listening, if uh, you're interested, the book is available uh, through Amazon online. And we will be back uh, through the Midwest region in two weeks from today to present a program uh, with a sports focus. So uh, that will be posted and emailed out to everyone uh, in advance uh, or presenter that morning will be the uh, deputy uh, sports editor uh, for the Chicago Sun-Times, uh, Jeff Agrist. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, we apologize for the technical difficulty and our thanks to Andy Coe. Have thank a you good very much. Thank you, Norm. Have a good day. Up and thank you, Andy Coe. Have a good day. We're everybody. out Chinese today. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you. All right, bye-bye.